Hi everyone, how are you doing? Um, yeah, I was really uh, fascinated um, when uh, Sarah got in touch. Um, I, do, I do a bit of speaking ab around the work that we do uh, as a business, um, but it's usually sort of fairly standardised stuff that we do in the industry. So to be asked to come and talk about something a bit left field and a bit interesting and try and break that down and apply that, um, yeah, it was fascinating. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's nice to be here. My name is Nick. Um, I uh, am managing director of a digital agency called SIFT Digital. We're based in Bristol. Um, and we work extensively, although not exclusively, uh, across the not-for-profit sectors. So with lots of big charities, NGOs, uh, and public bodies. Um, which just gives you a little bit of context for some of the things I'm going to be talking about today. And I would like to say that um, uh, those that know me and love me know that humility is not sort of a watchword that you would naturally associate with me. I'm a great big show off. I love doing uh, things like this, public speaking. So, you know, even the very fact that I'm stood here talking to you about humility is slightly ironic because this is an ultimately self aggrandizing exercise uh, in and of itself. So, um, where to start? I'd like to start by unpackaging uh, humility and trying to provide some sort of broader context around it. So, um, there's, lots of, uh, there's lots of different interpretations of the word. I've, I've picked this one, which is you know, the quality of having a modest or low view of, of one's own importance. But it can be interpreted in lots of different ways. It has lots of sort of religious context. Um, and actually, uh, the point Sarah made is it, she used the word an old-fashioned word. Um, well, interestingly, it is. Uh, this is a uh, graph which shows the decline in the usage of the word humility between 1800 and the present day. Um, and as you can see, uh, it's not fared well in the sort of semantic evolution uh, of language. Uh, and I was kind of thinking, why is that? So I thought, well, it peaked in the 1830s. Now, in the 1830s, there was a wave of revolution sweeping across uh, Europe, and all the high and mighty who were, let's face it, pretty bad at uh, expressing humility um, were getting their heads chopped off. Um, and it sort of reached its... so. so Humility was, was something that was actually quite widespread back in those days as a, as a term, as an expression, as a sort of concept. And then it reached its nadir in the 19, 1980s, which was really the sort of rise of the self. Um, and, you know, it's all about me um, generation. And my feeling is that that's kind of, um, that's extended into the current day. Uh, and this was a quote which I quite liked from an article in The Guardian last year. Um, you know, Welcome to the age of digital narcissism, a world of endless ostentation opportunities and unlimited bragging. Showing off has never been easier and ironically more celebrated. So I, I, I wanted to sort of use that as a, a, a sort of jumping off point. I think we all, we all sort of feel, uh, you know, all of us in this room, I, I imagine, feel sort of a bit of affinity with that, that the kind of social digital world has enabled a much more ostentatious and sort of self-centred mode of expression. Um, and so I'm going to give some examples of actually where we've tried to turn that on its head. Um, are you with me so far? Yeah? yeah? <laughs> Good. All right. I was thinking, what is he talking about? Um, so... First of all, let's try and break down humility because I really did try and think, well, how can I talk, you know, it's too abstract in and of itself. So what I wanted to do was sort of unpackage it and then try and talk 
uh, of the various component parts. So, look, we can all interpret things in different ways. For me, empathy comprises of these component parts. Empathy. Uh, so empathy allows you to understand the emotional context of other people. Um, Self-awareness also gives you the, uh, the grounding from which to, um, you know, not impose yourself on others. Accountability, I think, is a really important part of humility. It's being transparent and accountable for things that you do, things that you say, and, and the way in which you behave. Uh, and selflessness is, is a huge part of humility, which is really, um, you know, giving of yourself to others for no sort of personal gain. So I, I feel that that kind of, you know, uh, anyway, I had to have like a multi-Venn diagram in the presentation at some point. So, you know, just, just roll with it. Um, so let's talk about empathy. And I think in a sort of creative context, um, this, is, this is where this will have the most resonance. I'm assuming most people in the room work in or around the creative industries. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I, I think certainly for, you know, re reflecting back on, on my own career and the business that I now run, um, this is absolutely fundamental to our values and to our sort of core DNA and how we operate. So understanding that, that, that sort of emotional intersection of, of experience and interaction is, is really key. So um, empathy is composed of lots of, of different things. It's, it's, it's always insight driven. So uh, just to give an example of that, we, we now do an exercise. Whenever we win a new client, um, we, uh, we do a sort of um, client empathy mapping exercise. Once we've got to know them a little bit, it's not completely cold, but we just try and map out all of the different triggers, experiences, influences and behaviours that, that that individual or those individuals will be experiencing. Just to, you know, you know what it's like when you're working in a sort of high pressure environment, you know, shit can sometimes get a little bit tense and people can behave in, 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 in unusual ways. So it's important that you've, you're always having a more grounded, empathetic sense of a relationship um, so that you can understand your own triggers. Um, but also insight as in audience insight, people, real, real world insight. So really understanding uh, users or people or audiences or customers or whatever they might be uh, and their triggers and, and, and desires. Um, co-design or co-creation uh, is, is huge and it's huge for us and has been for many years uh, uh, and, um, and, and that's what I'm going to talk about a little bit because I think actually by bringing uh, the real world into the creative or experience design process um, that does engender uh, a humbling experience very often, of course predicated on whatever the work is that you're doing. But it can really, you know, you see through other people's eyes and you don't presume. So that's the next point. It really challenges any assumptions you might have or indeed your client or whoever it is you're, you're working something through with might have about what they expect from the audience that they're trying to engage with. Uh, and ultimately it's about that emotional validity, you know, making something really resonate. So I'm going to talk about uh, a, uh, an organisation we've been working with for a long time uh, called Carers Trust. Carers Trust are a social care charity who look after family carers, i.e. Uh, men, women and children that have to support uh, a sibling uh, or a parent um, unpaid just because they have no other choice. There's over six million um, unpaid family carers living in the UK today. Indeed, many of you in this room might have at some point have, have had to provide a, 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 a role of care to, to, to a family member or loved one. So uh, not only do they provide a great service and a great uh, national support network, but they're also real digital innovators. Uh, and for quite a small charity, they've been sort of leading the charge in sort of online uh, digital service delivery for, for a long time. So 
They, uh, we work with them over the years to create this kind of brand family because they service lots of different uh, groups. So they, they, their, their sort of main focus is, is adult carers because that tends to be where there are the most people in that, in that um, situation. Uh, but they also um, uh, serve young adult carers who tend to fall between the gaps between children's services and adult services. Uh, and so that was a real challenge for us to try and help them access that group. And they also work with young carers, i.e. so young adult carers 16 to 25 and young carers is under 16. Some of these kids are as young as 9 or 10 years old um, and, and putting, you know, doing some pretty remarkable things to keep their families' lives on track. So, as you can see, it was about, for us, the challenge was creating this kind of brand and experience family that is based on the values of support and care and compassion, all of which I think are, uh, you know, really relevant to what we're talking about this morning. So, we um, began the process uh, with a, um, a series of co-creation workshops with young carers uh, and young adult carers all over the country. Um, and, you know, it's, it's just great when a, when, a, when a client gives you the mandate to say, it doesn't matter what we want, it doesn't really matter what you want, it's all about what they want, you've just got to facilitate that. Um, you know, it's very empowering. And, you know, if you can articulate that to the young people that you're working with, uh, it's very empowering for them. So, um, so we began with all this series of workshops and we gave them full ownership of the, the strategy of the brand, of the, of the experience design, of the whole piece really, it was in their hands. And obviously, you know, they, they needed guiding along the way, but it was, it was ultimately, it was down to them. Um, so we worked through a whole range of different brand treatments and in the end for the young adult carers, we, we, we came with Matter, uh, which was the, um, there's a bit of rationalising the brand, so Matter communicates care and concern and value. To tell someone that they matter and that their contribution matters is a really empowering message. So you've got to remember a lot of these young people feel massively socially marginalised because you know, they, their mates are all going to the pub or going to the football or going to university. They don't have that opportunity, so they really feel like they, they, they just don't matter. They've fallen through the gaps. So it was really important to, for the brand to be a sort of empowering reflection of, of their lives. Um, and then the actual site itself, um, again, they really came up with this. It's a sort of scrolling uh, kind of social timeline, chronological timeline feature where you can tag different content types. Uh, and it was just they, that was an environment they felt very comfortable in and they felt they could interact and engage and pin their own content and you, you actually you can you can see you can drill into different uh, different content blocks and actually have conversations contextually within that within that piece of content or around that piece of content. Um, so it's just a little bit more and a little bit some of the offline um, offline advertising material that we worked with uh, worked on with them. Uh, and then we went, uh, phase two was to, was to look at Babbel, and Babbel is the, for the even younger generation. And the interesting difference between the two, between the, the young adults who were much more, you know, wanted that engagement and interaction, the really young people just wanted to, cons to just really to read content, consume content, and feel they were part of a safe and supportive environment. So hence we went for this much more sort of Pinterest uh, style approach, um, which just resonated with them more deeply. Uh, but you know, what I, what I want to sort of um, pull out from this, again, not trying to drift too far away from, the, from what we're here to talk about, is if you do go on some of these uh, communities and you actually read what, they're, what some of these young people are writing and, and saying to each other, it's extraordinary. Uh, and it really is uh, it really is an exercise in humility to just think, my goodness, you know, actually, how fortunate am I, are we, that we've never been put in this compromising situation? And also how selfless are these young people? And it's really, it's, it's incredibly moving, some of, the, uh, some of the stories and the narrative that comes out of working, um, working with these young people. So... 
So that is carer's trust. Now, on a similar theme, again, co-creation with young people. I don't know why, I've, I, but we've, this is something we've done a lot of. And for me, it's just, it is the best way of really just sort of letting go, you know, for the, for the organisations we work with, letting go of the ego and just being really open to completely different ways of doing things and also not, in, in, uh, you know, enforcing themselves on other people. So this um, project uh, was something we did with uh, a whole range of London galleries. So we worked with the South London Gallery, Tate, the Royal Academy, um, Whitechapel Gallery and the South Bank Centre. And it was funded by Louis Vuitton. Louis Vuitton invested a lot of money in the arts and it was called the Young Arts Programme. It was a three-year uh, investment to help young people who are sort of marginalised from the mainstream getting into contemporary art, um, particularly young people that lived on sort of sink estates in London and just didn't have access to that kind of world, but, you know, had the aspiration but not the access. So again, we began that process really just shaping the strategy and product development with, with a whole range of, of young people, primarily from the sort of greater London area. Um, and they, it was just, they were amazing. Um, and they absolutely owned it right from the outset. Uh, and the, the, again, the brand exploration was really thorough um, and they just fully immersed themselves in it and really got into, these are a whole load of treatments that, um, you know, with our help that they, they really came up with and owned. Um, and that resulted in the launch, just a couple of years ago now, of Recreative. Um, it's well worth having a look at. Um, Recreative. I can't remember what the, what the domain is anyway. Google it. Um, <laughs> Recreative is uh, the thing that I really like about it, which again, not trying to crowbar it back to humility, but it is actually a really interesting interpretation. So there's lots of these kind of um, online por art portfolio pieces, which are really like the, hey, look at me, look at my work um, environments. Recreative was never supposed to be about that. And that was what was really exciting about it. It was, it was actually the whole fundamental uh, thinking behind it, which again came from these young people was, I don't want to know about how great other people are. I want to know about how they do it. I want to know about the creative process. So this space, this, this community and all of the, the cool stuff they do around it is about helping young people demystify um, the, the creative process around contemporary art. You know, for instance, they, they took a whole gang of, um, uh, what's his name? Is it Anish Kapoor? You know, the guy that does the big, um, he did that amazing, I'm struggling here, <laughs> that amazing installation in uh, the turbine the turbine gallery at, at um, Tate Modern and he does those huge big structural pieces and they took all these kids from the community that sort of won a competition online to go to his workshop and actually in his workshop it's just a bunch of structural engineers and builders and brickies and they're just getting on with it and you know it was amazing for them to actually see that it's actually quite a prosaic kind of just functional thing and it's not this woo shiny objects in an art gallery so that's what recreative is about and again I think that's you know, it was really amazing, again, for those art galleries and, you know, galleries and people in galleries can often be a little bit, you know, maybe condescending to the younger audience and to aspirational young people. And they really let go and just said, yeah, let's unpack it all. Let's take away the mythology that this is a really difficult, inaccessible thing. So I think that was, again, a very empowering experience. So do, do check it out. Cool. So... Um, Another really important part of humility, which I, which I touched on earlier, is accountability. Um, and I think this is important whatever you are, whatever you do. So if you're a big blue chip corporate, I mean, look at the, you know, look at the terrible hubris that, um, that is hovering over, uh, you know, big banks and big retail at the moment, because they... You know, their ego, their business ego dictates they're too big to care and they're too big to fail. Look at, look at Tesco's, look at Lloyds Bank, look at um, RBS. You know, there's so many examples of in that world, in that big, you know, big, big business world where accountability is just not on the agenda, you can really end up um, looking like a bit of a dick. Um, but... Uh, um, 
in the worlds that, that you know, we operate in quite a lot and not-for-profits, there's a real dependency on being accountable because actually you've got a bunch of people in the real world giving you cash to solve a problem. And if you're not transparent about that and if you're not accountable to your donors, just in the same way as big business needs to be accountable to their shareholders and their customers, um, you're, in, you're, you're in trouble, you know, because it, it, you think you're protected by this sort of shell uh, of, you know, this sort of impenetrable ego. So a couple of examples that I wanted to share with you. This is really interesting. Um, was a woman that I was speaking to a few years ago, works for a Canadian NGO. Um, uh, I can't remember, they're called, I think they're like Engineers Without Borders. They do lots of sort of structural um, aid. I mean, they will definitely be in Nepal at the moment, helping to look at the sort of building infrastructure and, and making that right. Um, but she basically was a program director on a big project and they, they screwed up and they screwed up quite badly. And what usually happens because NGOs are really fearful of this getting out into the public domain, <coughs> it gets swept under the carpet and no one talks about it and you kind of move on. And what she did was she, with, I think with uh, the blessing of the senior management, she said, no, I want to talk about this. I've got to talk about this because actually this happens all the time, this kind of fuck up. And if we don't learn from it, we're never going to improve. So she did talk about it and she got a huge groundswell of positive response from right around the world from that community, from the sort of international aid and development community. Uh, and that led her to develop um, Admitting Failure, which is a, an online community and resource for people in that world to say, Do you know what, didn't go so great actually, and to invite the dialogue with the funders with other NGOs and with infrastructure people to say, well, how can we make things better? So I don't know if that would play out so nicely in like the global retail space. Uh, I can't see Tesco's um, signing on the dotted line uh, to admit failure. But, um, you know, I think it's a, it's, it is a lesson to be learned for anyone, actually. It's all right to fail. And actually, in, in, in digital, if, you're, if you think you're progressive and you're an innovator, you know, test and learn, uh, you know, think of all the startups that doubtless some of you have been involved with that just didn't quite play out. It's not the end of the world, right? Because you learn and next time you, you got it right. So I think uh, being, being honest and being accountable, really important. Another thing that I'm a big fan of just from a sort of design context, which I wish happened more, is um, dynamic dashboards. I don't know if you guys are familiar with dynamic dashboards. So rather than um, you know, businesses or charities or whatever having big, glossy, expensive, 50-page annual reports, they just have a dynamic, data-driven dashboard easily available on the website. You can just go on, you can see quite clearly what they're doing, how effective they're being, how they're spending their money. So this is um, uh, the Dallas Mu uh, Museum of Modern Art um, in the States. Just one that I particularly like. It's dead simple. The information's really clear and unambiguous. Uh, and, you know, it's just, it, it tells you what they're up to and, and how, they're, how they're achieving it. Um, another really nice example. Have you heard, has anyone here heard of Charity Water? Nope. Yes, a few people. So, um, Charity Water are really interesting. They're like a sort of pure play digital NGO. Um, so, they're more like a kind of sophisticated tech business that also happens to be really good at delivering major uh, water aid projects in, um, in the devel developing world. But again, just, you know, go and have a look at them, browse around their site. They're so open, they're so transparent about what they're doing, why they've done it, and how they're going to achieve impact. And, and critically, how they spend every cent of every dollar that they get. Super, super transparent and really good use of design and tech to, uh, to achieve that, that kind of brand brand traction that they now have. Uh, okay. So, uh, and then a little story from um, some time ago in, in my career, um, before I was um, in the agency world, I, I, I did various things in the corporate sector and not-for-profit sector, um, mainly sort of building and running digital teams. And many years ago, I ran a digital team for the country's biggest breast cancer charity, Breast Cancer Care. 
uh, and we were one of the first, um, the first not-for-profits to use online engagement as a sort of direct form of patient support. Uh, and we set up, set up this community, which is still, one, I think, one of the biggest communities in that space, um, supporting women with cancer, with breast cancer. Um, we went through a major redesign. Um, and, you know, we were very, it was very engaged, very user-led, very, etc. But we wanted to be completely transparent all the way through. So that involved full kind of dynamic engagement with the community about exactly what we're doing and why we're doing it. And then inevitably, at some point, the question was asked, how much does this cost? And so we, you know, we checked with the chief exec and said, look, they're asking about the money. We've been honest about everything else. Can we be honest about the money? She said, yes, we have to be. So we said, look, it cost about 100 grand. Uh, and um, inevitably, that provoked a bit of a firestorm on the community. Um, and we thought, right, we're not going to step into this. We're just going to see how it plays out. And it, there was a lot of uh, negative. How dare you spend all that money? That's ridiculous. And there was some positive. Anyway, eventually, this woman who was a sort of long-term sort of passionate advocate of the community stepped in. And, um, and, and did this post. And it was one of the most sort of extraordinary transformative moments uh, uh, where she said, you know, whether 100K was right or wrong to spend, it's spent and these guys have done all they can. And then, you know, very moving piece about, um, you know, the, the, this, this community, this space was just priceless to her and the experiences that she was going through. So, for me, that was, you know, more than anything else that I've done in my career, that was such a sort of strong endorsement for being open, transparent and accountable. Well, ultimately, however difficult the conversations are that you've got to have with customers, supporters, patients, whatever they might be, um, ultimately, only by being, uh, you know, honest and, and, and true will those things play out in the right way. So, we're nearly there. And a final sort of cautionary tale. Beware the humble brag. I, I'm presumably you're all familiar, possibly painfully familiar with the humble brag and, and how easy it is to slip into it as well. Um, I mean, you know, it, I, it, even when I got here last night and I was chatting to Sarah on the phone, I was sort of slipping into myself by going, oh, you know, I'm so tired, I'm so busy, you know, I'm just so important. <laughs> Um, but, uh, uh, you know, a lot of people use social media particularly as a sort of masking device. Harvard Business School have just done a study on the humble brag and they have proved beyond any doubt that you're better off just out and out boasting. So I think the message, the message I'd like to leave you with is if you've got something to shout about, just go big guns. Yeah, don't, don't wrap it up in a veneer of being all honest and modest. Um, so that is the note that hopefully uh, um, wraps up what I hope has been a, a coherent uh, interpretation of humility and how design and digital can help you articulate that as an emotion. So thank you very much.